Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm glad he showed up. Oh, maybe it's just me. I, maybe I feel a little bit better. I got up and I ironed my shirt and made sure that it was nice and pressed. I thought I was just doing it to impress one of y'all, but instead I, I knew that I got ready for what was about to happen tonight, that God's spirit would be here willing and able to touch each and every person under the sound of my voice. Yes. Hallelujah. You want to stand for the reading of the word if that's your custom? If you'd like to do that, hallelujah. I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Starting in verse 16, <clears throat> that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with mighty by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and depth and height. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Right. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh within us. We'll go to Jude chapter 1. My first time in Jude. I just realized that today. I read it a bunch of times. My first time that God spoke to me out of the book of Jude. Chapter 1 but and verse 20 says, But ye beloved... Behold, or building, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Right. Romans chapter 5, verse 5 says, And hope maketh not a shame, because of the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The last set of scriptures I want to read to you from Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 1 says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. For the next few moments, I'd like to preach to you from the topic or the subject, His sweet savor, our great delight. Heavenly Father, right now, Lord, I ask you to anoint me, Jesus. Lord, anoint our ears, Lord Jesus. Lord, anoint our hearts, Lord. Not only to be hearers, but doers of your word, Lord Jesus. I ask you right now, Lord. Lord, that your love be shed abroad in this place, Jesus. Lord, that we're willing to grab a hold of miracles, signs, and wonders tonight, Lord. Lord, I ask you all these things in your mighty name. And everybody said amen. amen. You can sit down if you're going to preach with me. Amen. I got two amens off the bat. That's what I'm talking about. I want to. Uh, I don't want to embarrass nobody. One of my oldest friends is in the house tonight. I want to thank him for showing up. I uh, one of the hardest things as a preacher that I've encountered is not reading the Word and not studying. It's not even flowing in and out of the Spirit whenever the God's moving and all that. My hardest thing is 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 uh, sometimes you want to do good. For, you know, I want, him, I want my wife to be proud of me, and I want this. And then one of my oldest friends is in the house, and I want him to be proud of me. And then uh, God just tells me to shut up and say what I told you, boy. And I just, I just, I just do that, and that makes it easier on me. I don't have to worry about it. So if, if you don't like it, take it up with Jesus. How about that? Amen. I was wondering when I would use this, but I, I, me and Brother Don were on the same page. I started Saturday night after I got home, and. And I started reading while I was in bed, and I was studying a little bit, and God started to speak to me about the love of God. And then this morning, I, I got up, and I was in my living room, and I was crying, and I was reading the Word of God, and it was washing over me very heavy this morning. And I started to listen to old hymns and started to sing songs that I couldn't even find. A song that we used to sing, and I thought for sure that YouTube would have somebody singing it. I found one version, and I wouldn't share it to save my life. It sounded horrible. I don't know who made it, but it was rough. 
But I couldn't find the song anywhere else, but yet it was in my heart. And I started to sing it, and I would sing it over and over again. I remember when I was a child hearing it for the first time, but I remember more so the moment I felt the song. You know, you could say things over and over again. One of the most things that aggravate me right now with slang is that ONG junk, that on God. I can't stand that. We put a lot of stuff on God that God didn't sanction. Uh, but we say a lot of things sometimes, and until you feel it, until you understand what the words feel, what they mean, you know, we can just say some stuff. And uh, I actually wrote down two, two verses or, or parts of a song that I want I to read about the love of God. It says, could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Now, if you're my age or, or maybe younger, you don't quite understand what that really was. But in, in regular old English, what it was is, is that if every tree, if every stick, if everything in this world, if the whole ocean was ink and in the whole sky they had a scroll and that we could write on what we see from sky to sky, we could not ever write enough. We would fill it up that we could never tell about all of God's love. And then the song that was stuck in my, my head and my heart, it says, The love of God is more to me than all this world could ever be. It reaches down from the throne of glory and sets the vilest sinner free. The love of God. <laughs> I, uh, I'm not going to get emotional, but I promise you this right now. God has spoken his word. It was hard for me to come up with a title until I read in Ephesians 5 where it said that be therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love. That love there is agape love. That's not storge. That's not brotherly love. That's not none of that eros. That's not that philio stuff. That, that's all Greek words for love just in case you had never read the Greek. But, but agape love is God's love. It's something other than this world. It, it was brought here. It was brought here by God. It's nothing that me and you could ever accrue. It is God's love. And it says that therefore followers of God's children walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling Savior. His sweet savor, our great delight. Let me get out from behind this thing. I started to sing these songs, and I started to talk about the love of God. And the pastor want to call me at 8 o'clock this morning. <laughs> want to call me. And my, um, my beautiful wife had went to watch her son play ball in Beaumont. He's going to call me at 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to tell on him. He called me at 8 o'clock in the morning and told me, you're a pastor. You ought not walk to church. I had no plans on walking to church. But I can, though. It ain't that far. I've done it many a times. I've walked here many a times. From my house, but he called me just to remind me that in case I needed a ride, that he would be more than happy to come and get me. But when he first started talking to me on the phone, he started to, he always does, he started to preach to me what he was going to preach this morning. And I had to call him out later on. I was like, what you preaching on today? The love of God? And he said, how'd you know? I said, man, he's been beating me up with it for like a whole day now, since yesterday and all the way this morning. So obviously God has positioned his church and those who are watching online and those who are visiting tonight and those who are here on a regular basis and maybe those who have been asleep on all the other sermons and now you're awake. Wherever you fall at inside of those areas, all right? Well, hey, I, I wasn't picking on Sister Susan. That pastor did that. Just making sure. Wake up, girl. I'm going to touch you like he does. But wherever you fall out at, if you fall in the Sister Susan category, you fall in everybody else. <laughs> wherever you fall at tonight, obviously God has positioned us and he wants to wake us up to the love of God. I think too often we think we know what the love of God. And I'm going to tell you right now, when I used to hear those and sing those hymns back then, I thought I knew what the love of God was. I, you know, here it is, I'm like 19 years old and I'm singing about the vilest sinner he set free. I don't even know if I'd done anything when I was 9 or 10 years old. I know a lot of y'all don't believe it, but I was a good Christian little boy. Uh, I actually went to youth camp for Jesus, like the rest of y'all. Uh, I know. it was. Well, I'm telling you, I got good stories, prayer meetings and all night stuff. I got all that good stuff. I didn't start acting up till later, all right? 
But I didn't really know or understand the love of God until I needed to understand the love of God. You know, I feel like a lot of us, we, we, we got a lot going on in life, but, but we don't understand how much we need the love of God. How often that we run into a situation where if we had an understanding and awakening of what the love of God really was, how we would skip some of the heartache. Or maybe through the heartache, we would have something to hold on to. Anybody in here has ever gone through anything hard understand what it's like. And I could give you analogy after analogy of how it's almost like being in a boat without a paddle and you're just adrift on the current of life. Right. Try being on probation. Try being in a place where you have no say. In other words, of your freedom is in check at all times. At any given moment, they could pull your card. Right. And if you ain't ever been on probation, then you don't understand that. But those people who have understand that at any given moment that life can change for you in the worst possible way. And it feels like sometimes the things that we go through that we're inside of a boat, a piro in the ocean, no paddle and you're just adrift. But when you know the love of God, when you understand the love of God. Now, it's a double-edged sword, it's a double entendre. The scripture I actually read to you says that you have to know that, that any, like all saints should come to the knowledge of God's love. But then the scripture right next to it says that the love is, is passeth all knowledge. Right. There we go. The Bible's contradicting here. That's what they say. The Bible's con it's not contradicting. The problem with us is, is our minds have not been elevated yet. The Bible says that when we get to heaven that he's going to open up all knowledge to all things. And until we are in the middle of love and we're walking on streets of love. Oh, I know we call it gold, but until you are the completion of God's love in your life, that we don't really know, we think we know, but until you start to get to the point where you start to sing those old tunes, and you start to hum it. I sent my father-in-law one, too. All of a sudden, my brain just went flat, and I don't even remember that one. But it's them old songs that, that drag up old feelings. And all of a sudden, when I'm looking at fresh new problems, this is the problem is, we look for new things in this world. Generation, I promise you, this is, I'm, I'm sorry, I feel bad for you sometimes because we come out of different generations where we understood what things meant. Nowadays, we do whatever we feel. And we, and we, we expect God to follow the trend in the culture. Someone said something a while back, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and bust that all up real quick, that the church is not a counterculture to this world. The church is separated for a purpose. You're, when you're separated for a purpose, it's not about culture anymore. It doesn't matter what the world or what you got going on in your school, your family, or what anybody else says. It doesn't matter what they say. If the Bible says it, if God said it, then that's just the way it is. I don't want to step on nobody's toes. But we can, we can claim all this, all these little things that we want to claim. The problem is that we are not awakened to God's love. And Pastor talked about it perfectly this morning. Perfectly. I shared that video with two or three of my friends. You ought to go do the same. Because he talked about without God's love that you don't even know God. You don't even know what love is without knowing God. The Bible says that God is love. How can you go around telling your wife, your spouse, your brother, your sister, your wannabe girlfriend, your wannabe boyfriend, and all these other people, and you go around telling all your friends that you love them, but yet you don't even know God? And if you don't know God, how can you truly love? This is why things are cheap now. Words are cheap. This is why people say what they want to say and lead you astray. The Bible says that the Holy Ghost is what sheds God's love abroad in our hearts. It just all come to me earlier today when I was just doing this study because I was going to try to change this sermon. I was. Cause Brother Don stomped all over that God love. He did the best job ever. And I was thinking, I'm not preaching that. I'm going to preach something else. Uh, I thought about preaching that. You're going to hell if you don't go to heaven. But I, 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 think, I think I already preached that one before, so I can't preach that one again. Yeah, there you go. So that's what I did. And all of a sudden, I started to realize something that, that Jesus Christ, his sweet savor, his sacrifice, is God's love. And he said it perfectly this morning. That God loves you exactly where you are. Exactly the way you are. And until you understand that God's love is like a non-stop current. Trying to pull you off the beach of sin. Into the vast ocean of what God really has for you. Until you understand that in your life. What happens is you sit on the shore and cry about all the waves. How it sure would be nice to travel on somewhere else. 
It's like being marooned on your own little island and all you can think about is the problems that you have and the mistakes that you've made. And God's love is so vast and so great that he sent back the comforter in the first place. Do you understand that you have no place in this world asking for anything because you were born into iniquity. You have nothing to stand on. Your righteousness is like filthy rags. Everything points against you. You're guilty. You're guilty. But God's love says that exactly where you are at exactly the time that you're ready that I'm willing to pull you off that shore I'm willing to rescue you from all the things that you feel that you're bound up in yeah. one of the hardest things in life is to preach to a Christian and try to get them saved <laughs> think about it for a second I'll, I'll wait I got time sun's still out one of the hardest things in the world is somebody who knows everything. You know? Try to tell them about electricity. You could be an electrician. You could be an electrical engineer. But somebody who knows everything always knows something. Oh, yeah, one time, man, we crossed that up. We put this over here. We jumped that, whatever. And all of a sudden, yeah, we got, we got 30 more amps out of it. And an electrical engineer tell you it ain't possible. But you'll sit there and argue with him. You ever know anybody like that that knows everything? Huh? Knows it all? And too often times we'll come in here and we know church and we know about Jesus and we know what the Bible says about Jesus. But yet we haven't unlocked the knowledge of the love of God in our lives to the point that we could ever tell anybody about it. We can tell you about my church. Come down to my church and meet my pastor. Huh? Oh, well, well, that's just like paying tithes. You can tell somebody about paying tithes all you want. But until you get into the middle of it and you pay tithes and all of a sudden you see things unfold financially for you, until you see doors open up that should have never opened up in the first place, until you put your money where your mouth is, you'll never understand. It's the same way with God's love. Until you're willing to stop loving yourself more than you love God, you'll never understand the love of God. How do I love myself more than I love God? Because I treat myself before I treat my God. Because I'll walk on whatever I can to walk on, to step on whatever I can to step on, because by God, it's my life, and I earned it, and I deserve it. You know what I love about the love of God? It's when the love of God steps onto your shore, even the demoniac can find peace. Oh, we like to judge everybody, all right? We like to judge murderers, thieves, pedophiles, rapists, all that. We got levels for everybody. Them liars, even though the Bible says they got their place in the lake of fire, we got them way down at the bottom. Them gossipers, because most of us do it. That's why we rank it real low, too. We don't want to rank too high on the scale that we got going on. But we'll look down on those who, who shoot up, those who smoke it, those who snort it. There's a hierarchy in it. All right? And when there's a hierarchy in it, that's what we, we start to tell people what the love of God will do. But I'm telling you right now, if you're going to look at anybody, you're going to look at the naked man cutting himself, tormented, having all them demons inside of him, and you're going to look at the love of God walk on the shores, and in one moment, there's peace in the city. And all of a sudden, in the tombs where there was cutting and gnashing and wailing, and there was no peace at all, it was nothing but chaos, the love of God walked into that situation. Walked into that situation, and in a moment, there is peace. Because the love of God is his sweet savor. The fact that he came and he died for you. Yes, yes. Oh, we love to talk about that cross around Easter time, and it's coming. Easter is coming. You can't miss it. Peanut butter eggs are out there in, in, in big old bags. I love them. I do. I ain't going to lie to nobody. I love them peanut butter eggs. I, you can tell. You can tell. But we'll start to talk about that there cross here shortly. And we love to have Jesus up on that cross because that's the moment. But all of a sudden, whenever he comes up out of that tomb, that's when the love really starts. Oh, yeah, he loved us enough to die. The Bible said it. While we were yet sinners. What I like about it is a couple of verses before that. It says that in due time, he died for the ungodly. Just to break the ice, that's you. That's me. Oh, I ain't got nothing special just because I got on the dress shirt. That's all of us. We are the ungodly. We earn nothing in this life. There's nothing that you can do. I don't care how good you've been. You'll never atone for the life that you've lived. 
I had to come to grips with that for a long time ago. I'll never be able to make up for all the lives that I destroyed, all the different things that I done, all the all the dirt that I done and did in this life. I'll never make up for it. It will never happen. I don't care if I don't eat every day and and I pray and I worship and I shave my head and become a monk or whatever it is you think is godly, whatever. You know, whatever you think the higher echelon cuz we always labeling stuff. Whatever you think the most godly adventure you can have in this life. Go give all you own, baby. We're going to go to Africa. We're going to go down there and be missionaries and all that. And we're taking all the kids with us. We're going to go dig ditches out there in Botswana. Whatever in your mind you think is what you got to do to give up yourself enough. You can never earn God's love. And in a moment, all of a sudden, whenever he walks into your situation, the reason why a lot of us stay sick is because we don't understand the love of God. He said it this morning. He stomped all over it. That all of a sudden, we'll start to judge ourselves harshly. And we start to look at X, Y, and Z. We got that algebra love. Where we, the, the, the parts are unknown, but we know there's a formula that if we somehow could reach this one certain formula, that all of a sudden it'll be okay for God to heal us. When the love of God is knocking on everyone's door in this place tonight, that God's already spoken to us in the fact that he's here not only to heal, but to set free and deliver. He's here to change your whole world and your trajectory. And he doesn't do that with just power. He does it with the love of God because he loved you. He loved you from the beginning since he known you he loved you. He loved you enough to hang on that tree, but he loved you enough to get up to send back the Holy Ghost, who then he said that the reason how you get, the, this is part of the problem too. A lot of us ain't spoken tongues and, and gotten involved with God in a while. Oh, I just prove it by the, uh, by the word of God. It says that the love of God is shed abroad on the inside in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Where you think you hold it at? It ain't in your purse. You can't bring the Holy Ghost around with you like an accessory. The love of God made it possible so that we could all be filled. And not only filled, but that it would be abundantly over. That it's supposed to flow out of us like rivers of living water. This is why a lot of times we'll hate on people who are doing good. Because our river stopped up. Because we don't understand that the love of God is for everybody. That he loves you like he loves me. And the fact is it doesn't matter how bad I was and how good you were. That he loved me the same. And because the love of God has shed abroad for all of us, there is a sweet aroma. You know why some of us, he said this morning, why some of them, them uh, pews and some of these chairs is empty? Because whenever you come in contact with Jesus, you're supposed to be able to smell something good. And too often times our Christianity, whatever we call Christianity, smells like trash. Smells like personal gain. Smells like personal want. Personal preference. Smells like it smells like standards that people can't live up to. It smells like it smells like things that 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 Jesus never asked us to do. It smells like things that are, are good for us, the type of music we like. That's what it smells like. It smells like my personal preference on a God made thing. That's what it smells like. But the Bible tells us that whenever, whenever Jesus decided, the human man Jesus, you know, God incarnate, whenever he decided. That enough was enough that even though we were sinners, that he saw me in my most cracked out time in my life. That he saw me in the worst that I've ever done. Things that I'll never admit to none of y'all. But the things that he always saw. When he saw me right then, he still was willing to die for me. And he still was willing to send back the Holy Ghost. And he still was willing to elevate me and to heal me. I don't know about you, but I used to have migraines most of my life. When I was 20-something years old, God healed me from that. Then He didn't have to do that. He knew what I was going to be. He knew I would sling dope, cook dope, run around, do all the, the things that y'all don't like to talk about. He knew all that, but yet he still healed me. Because the love of God is so per- This is why we can't understand it. And I ain't hammering on nobody. Don't take it the wrong way. All right? But I'm going to tell you something right now. I would search out the love of God like, it was a, like I was a bloodhound. If I thought for one moment that I had one need in the house, if there was, if the creditor was coming and my babies was going to have to be taken, and I knew that some, something had to be done, I think I would search out all the pots that I could get in the house, like the little widow woman, and make sure that every pot was going to be filled with oil. Here's the problem: the love of God allows every the oil doesn't run out until we limit God. When you start to limit the love of God in your life. 
all of a sudden you'll live like that flea he talked about. Or somebody talked about it. I heard it here recently. Maybe me and you talk about a lot of stuff. That flea, and you put that jar on that flea. A flea can jump 30-something feet, if I'm not mistaken, or 30-something inches. I don't remember exactly how it is, but, but he can jump real high. But if you put him in a, a jar and you put the lid on it, he'll bump his head only so many times. And then after that, they have watched a flea, and he'll jump to about that much before he hits his head. And then you can take the cap off. And you've allowed this world... And your visions, and I'm sorry some of us maybe had bad parents, some of us had bad leadership, maybe we come out of bad churches, or maybe we come out of bad experiences and all that, but you've allowed these little different things to put a cap on your idea of God's love. So now all you're willing to believe for is just a little bit of something. So that's just the truth. You're, you're, you're looking at, some of y'all looking at me like, like it's not the love of God that does all the miracles in the first place. He don't take stripes on Calvary for your healing unless he loves you. Or he's not doing it just because it feels good. I promise you it don't. He's not doing it because that's just the plan. You have to love somebody. You learn that whenever you work construction and you get tired of working it and you get up in the morning and I want to stay home. I don't go to work because I like it. I'm not going to lie to nobody. Everybody knows. I go to work because I love my family. Well, I can prove it. There's plenty of people out there that don't go to work. And they allow their, their family to struggle. They allow their family to struggle. They'll sit there and watch their kids have the things that, that they could have better, but they just have what they have. They'll sit there and watch their wife struggle and work while they don't work. We all know, and right now your mind's going to somebody right now in your brain. That deadbeat, you know, get off of it. You'll be all right. God loves them too. The problem is, is that person is the flea. And they've allowed their self. They bumped a few times. They believed a couple of times. They came down to the front a couple of times. They allowed brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so to speak in their life a couple of times. And whenever they bumped their head a couple of times, they didn't understand that God's love was endless. That it was, it was everything that it was supposed to be. It's everything that the Bible says that it is. And all of a sudden, you bumped your head a few times and you've allowed life to limit you. And you are limiting yourself because you're understanding of God's love. You want to know why people run off to cults and all that? He said it this morning. He didn't say what I thought he was going to say. We probably should have. I felt it, though. I know you were thinking. The reason why people run off to live scandalous lifestyle. The reason why they live in sin and things that all of us would turn our nose up at. Is because they find love somewhere else that they don't find in the church. The reason why we believe that all those, I mean, we never, none of our, well, how in the world they follow David Koresh? He walked around Walmart telling people he was Jesus, and they just went live over there. You know why? Because he loved them and he listened to them. Because love, it, it, the love that he tried to imitate was God's love. And when you don't, when you bump your head too many times and you don't get what you think God's love is and you change your perception, you allow this world to warp your mind. We're going to take some responsibility. I understand the world's done a lot of us dirty. I know that life's been hard for lots of us. Let me just be honest with you, though. All right? You find out where true love is when you read Isaiah 53, I believe it is. I believe it's Isaiah 53. And you start to hear Isaiah talk about the man Jesus. And he says that he was bruised for our iniquity. He said that he, he borne our griefs. In other words, he lifted them off of us. That the chastisement of our peace, in other words, the price... That he, he paid, not us. You didn't have to pay for nothing. You just have to come to the realization that it's yours. Because it's just like if the Holy Ghost is a gift. Y'all read it. All right. The Bible says it's a gift. And if it's free and he is giving it freely. And then the Bible says that the Holy Ghost sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts. That means that we have a disconnect. And we have to take some responsibility for the fact that we turn away when we should turn towards. And I understand, I'm not going to beat you up. I've been there. I turned away many a times. Huh. I've turned away many a times. But the love of God 
It's ever flowing. It's ever, it's vast and it's bigger to the height, the breadth, the width. And all of a sudden it starts to talk about that the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And then it, talk, and it just paints this ugly picture how he wasn't beautiful and there was nothing good about him. And, and he came and he gave everything and he was not guilty, but he was hung on a tree for our iniquity and all that. And then there's a semicolon, which means there's something next. This verse it bothers me. It hurts me. It hurts me for Christ. I feel sorry for him. I, I feel bad. I, I already, I started to cry earlier today. I was thinking about the love of God in my life, and I did not deserve it. But yet he keeps pouring, and he's pouring in it. And he keeps giving and giving, and I don't deserve none of it. I don't deserve none of it. And all of a sudden, they got that semicolon. I started to think about this service, and I was like, I don't know, God. I don't know. We already heard about love. And then he's like, oh, we got to hear about it again. Huh? We have to understand what it is. We got to understand there's a disconnect, David. I, I, I need people to understand that the love of God, that I'm loving them unconditionally. That even when I, you turn your back on God, even if you walk out of here today and you say that man don't know nothing, that my friends and my this and my group, and my Snapchat, and my Instagram, and my Facebook, and all my people at school, and all my people at work, and my family, and all these people, they're the ones telling the truth. And that man's a liar. Even when you walk out of here, and you curse God, and you leave, the love of God follows you, and it follows you, and it follows you. And all of a sudden, you get to a point where you wake up. The whole point of preaching is, is to wake you up before it's too late. That's the whole point of preaching. It's not because I want to be up here. I don't look good up here. I look overweight. You know, it's not so you can see me. It's because the love of God is running through me so much that I feel amiss. I feel bad when I don't talk about it. I feel bad when I don't talk about Jesus. Not because I'm somebody special, but because I got something I didn't deserve. I did not deserve everything he did for me. I don't deserve to be standing here right now. I should have done my 12 years. I should have died alone. I should have not made it, but the love of God washes over me and over me. And no matter how many times I curse God, no matter how many times I walked away from him, no matter how many times I spit in his face, no matter how many times I hung him afresh, the Bible says that when we know we have the knowledge of him and we do our sin, we hang him afresh yes. on the cross. Oh, I know that's hard. And, that's a, and we'll get to that self-condemnation. Here's the problem with self-condemnation. You took God out of it. That's why it says self-condemnation. It's all you. It's the you show. Feel sorry for yourself another time. The world is coming to an end at a faster pace than it used to. And in this moment, you don't have time to feel sorry for yourself. It's time to go ahead and shake off self-condemnation and say, you know what, God? I'm ready to receive exactly what you have for me. And when I start to understand that the knowledge of God and I start to understand that the love of God is shed abroad by the Holy Ghost, then I'll make sure that I'm afresh every time I can. I'll make sure I will rebaptize myself every chance I get why you wonder why you wonder why Paul said that I speak in tongues more than all of you because he had a past because there was a donkey there was a road there was Stephen Stephen died he understood he was the, the chief among sinners you got to understand where Paul come from he understood the love of God he did not deserve what he had this is why he can write from a jail cell and say, you know what, <laughs> don't worry about me, I suffer for Christ. Don't worry about me. What he's really saying is, is God has loved me so much. His love is so great that even in my jail cell, I feel good. <laughs> even in my jail, even though I'm suffering with this or that, if you die from your ailments, I'm sorry, but I'm telling you right now, if you're in Christ, you will be shed up, you will be healed in that moment when you walk on streets of gold. In that moment, if you have to struggle all your life with a lame leg or a broken back, even in that moment, whenever, if God doesn't heal you, if the love of God chooses not to heal you here, that you will be healed. Because you'll walk right on street to go in a new body, in a new heart, in a new mind. And the love of God is shed abroad by the Holy Ghost. And, and all of a sudden, we, we forget that. We leave that for the few people that want to speak in tongues. Not everybody. We don't need all that. We'll let Pastor and them talk about it. We'll let them do it. Huh? Let Brother Charles speak in tongues. Be all right. I'll be good from where I sit. I'm going to tell you right now, the love of God washes every sin away. Not only does it wash every sin, but it fills every crack that we've allowed the world and other people. Look, everything wrong with you isn't your fault. But the love of God still takes care of your fault, their fault, everybody's fault. 
You don't understand the love of God doesn't have, doesn't have rivers and streams. It's one major flow. It's being poured out on a daily basis. And here we are walking around with umbrellas. It's what I think, what I feel, and what I am. I'll do it my way. I'll do it my way. and I'll keep trying. And most of us are like that flea. We're stuck in an eight-inch jar with 32 inches of reach. We were talking about dreams before church, me and Robert. He's trying to live his dream right now. Doing, doing, so I, I told him, you know, you can, always, you can always come back to the plants. I can get you a job right now, you know. And he told me something he probably wouldn't have told me back in the day, but he told me something I felt good about, and I said exactly what I said for a reason. He said, but I'm, I'm, I'm living, this is my dream. And since we've been preaching this series about living the dream and all that, and I, and I told him, I said, you know what you need to do? You need, you need to live it. You need to stick with it. You need to stay on it. You need to get, God will bless it. God will make it more. I promise you. God will lift it up. God will do everything. If you give it to him, it's your dream. God put it in there for a reason. You don't have to work for the man. You can be the man. Work for yourself. Amen. That's part of his, his uh, plot in life. Any of us. We all had that same opportunity. A lot of us passed it up. A lot of us still had that opportunity. We think we passed it up. Because we have that little eight inch reach, that vertical jump, and, and the love of God is shed abroad. It says that, that we couldn't even write how great it is, and we limit God's love, and we tell God, it's all right, I don't need that. It cost me too much. Did it cost you? Did it cost you really? It was, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace, the moment that we can sit back and breathe in bed, the fact that we're not hunted like dogs. The fact that you can breathe at night, the fact that you can leave here, the fact that you have all these blessings and food and places to stay and all these different things. Yeah, we got problems, but problems ain't problems if you got God. Right. It's just something else that you have to deal with today. But, but he said that he was sent back to comfort and that would give you peace. That passes all understanding. The love of God loves you so much. Listen to me. The love of God loves you so much. So much. That even in a moment where we feel like it's not possible, whenever we think that it's just another day in the neighborhood, right. it's the moment that the world turns black and the veil is rent. You understand that he walked around preaching love, talking about love. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemy. He says to love your enemy. What? How we don't understand that until all of a sudden we understand that we were the enemy. That we were the one that sent him to the cross. That we were the one that, that, cho that chose the brush. But I, I, I'm getting back to it. But we get back to the semicolon. Yeah. It says. And all of a sudden we, he's, he's hurt. It says so that we can be healed. I just paraphrase it. He talked about all the things that, that he was that was done to him, and all these things. And at the very end of the scripture, it, it blew my mind back. I couldn't understand it, but all of a sudden, it said to heal us. What? Are you serious right now that the love of God He's telling us? And I started to cry, and it broke me. And I was thinking about Jesus Christ going to all the things that I'd done, and then I started thinking about all the times that I did them again, and I did them again, and I re repented, and I did it again. And every time He had to hang back on that tree one more time for me, and I started to get upset with myself. And then all of a sudden, the love of God came upon me. He said, and even in that moment, He thought enough about us that He did it for your healing. That he loved you enough. It's not just for salvation. Salvation is great. But salvation is later. Let me listen. I'm not going to. Let me look at the clock. All right. Salvation isn't going to happen right now. All right. I know that we've heard preaching like you're saved right now. You come down here and get filled with the Holy Ghost. You're not saved until you get off this rock. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll just, just let you know. Okay. You're on the way. You, you, you're, walking, you're walking in the right path, the, the, the highway of holiness. You're, you're walking it, all right? You're, you're getting there, okay? But until you make it to heaven, are you saved? Until the report cards come out, did you pass? Huh? It don't matter what the report card, the progress report said, but until all the grades are added up, you don't know. Here's the problem. The love of God loves us enough, even though the, all the grades aren't added up, that he's continually pouring into each and every one of us, saying, you know what, you're going to make it. You know what, I got a place for you. He said, if it were not so, I would not have told you that I go somewhere right now to build a mansion for you, that all that is the love of God, that even though you struggle down here, you want to know why drug addicts 
and people who are trashy and all the people that we like to talk about now that we're all sanctified and holified and all that other junk. You know why they make the best Christians? Huh? You know why I don't care what you think about me? Because God loves me. You know why I don't care? You know why it doesn't matter to me? You know why we make the best Christians? And I'm not down on y'all. I'm saying most of us in here are, oh, gutter people anyway. We all come from somewhere. Because the love of God is more to me. It's not a little trinket that I put on my little Holy Ghost stand at my bedroom at night. It's not a coin that you get. It's not just a little badge or, or anything like that. It's not just something that, that I just came up with. It's not, it's not something that's in, written in an old book that tells me about a guy who came and that. It's not that. It doesn't mean it touches every part of who you are. It touches everything in your life. Loving Jude, it says, but ye beloved, you whom I love is shed abroad on. Building up yourselves, your most holy faith. You look up that faith, talking about the religion, your faith, your faith in God, your faith in the Bible, the Holy Ghost, and baptism in Jesus' name, and all these different things, and building that up. In other words, you need to study. You need to do your, yourself good. You need to come and you need to listen. You need to go to youth, and you need to listen to your, uh, your teacher. You need to listen to your Sunday school teacher. You need to listen to all the preaching. You need to read that book. Boy, you need to read that book like nobody's business these days. You need to read the book. Get all that. Build up your faith. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Stir up the gift that's on the inside of you. Make sure it's afresh. Make sure because the love of God. It says that keeping yourselves in the love of God. This is what tells me. That you can be out of the love of God. And still go to church and build your faith. Oh look it got quiet because you, you're going to have to read it. Then go back and read you. I just read you the scripture. It says hey beloved. I'll read it to you again. But ye. That's you. Beloved. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. All right? Good. You need to read your Bible. Build up your faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. All right? There's a comma in between those two. And, all right? And pray in the Holy Ghost. Speak in tongues as much as you can. Feel that presence. Let it flow through you like rivers of living water. All right? Then there's a comma. Next scripture. And keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That means that they're not synonymous. That means that you can come to church. This is where we're messing up at. This is why we don't get healed. This is why things are, are bumping our heads. It's because we don't want to be in the love of God. We're fine with church as usual. We're fine with coming. Your attendance is important. Your tithe and your offering keep the, the place afloat. All that stuff's important. It's biblical. It's important. Praying in the Holy Ghost is important. Biblical. It's, it's in there. All right? It's in there. You need me to show you? I can show you. But you have to stay in the love of God. That means you need to stop waking up to your own self-love. Stop waking up to the love that the, these groups and communities with all their little acronyms and, and all the little letters and all that stuff that say that they love you. Stop waking up to that community and wake up to the love of God and say, I got to stay in this thing because I need to be in the love of God looking for the mercy of Jesus Christ until I get my eternal life. Stand with me right now. Hallelujah. You let me get passionate. You let me scream at you. You let me tell you what the Bible says. You sat here long enough. You're cold. You got blankets on. All that stuff's good. They're about to start the music here in a minute, and all of a sudden the lights are going to go down. But listen to me. If you're not going to put yourself in the love of God, I don't care what you think about me. If you don't like me, it's okay. I love you. But if you're not going to put yourself in the love of God, please, for God's sakes, don't sit inside of a little jar. When God has purposed in your life to make you a superstar. Yes. When God has meant for you to grow your business and to be more than who you are right now. When God has meant for each and every one of you to feel the love of God, to tow the love of God, to be invest in the love of God. Right. Don't sit there and feel like, you know what, it's just another service. I built my faith up. I preached out of Jude. That's good. Never preached out of that before. I heard what Jude is. Some of y'all are looking at me like, Jude. Huh? Jude, that's awesome, Jude. Huh? We heard about we heard about love. He re he referenced Brother Don a couple of times because it was an awesome message this morning. He preached out of Romans like he does all the time in Ephesians, and that's great. But the love of God means more to me than all this world could ever be, because it reaches down from the throne and saves the vilest sinner. 
a vilest sinner like me sets me free. It's not enough to come to church. I know this sounds like it's going to be a little controversial, but it's not enough just to speak in tongues. Listen to me. It's not the end all be all. Okay? You have to be in the love of God. And when you're in the love of God, you know what you'll do? You'll love your neighbor as yourself. You'll love your brother. What you'll do is you'll trust God with your healing. You'll trust God with your family. You'll trust God with your finances. You'll trust, you know why? Because the love of God pushes you further, farther, and faster than you've ever seen in your whole life. I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to stay where I am. I need to bust the cap off of my little jar and make sure that God is willing to take me where he said he is. Nothing worse than dying with promises in the pocket. There ain't nothing worse than two million people being swallowed up in the, in the wilderness waiting on the promised land. There's too much at stake. There's too many family members, too many friends that need the love of God. There's too many people under the sound of my voice right now that need a healing. Let me explain to you. If you go ahead and trust the love of God, the love of God will push you. It will make you quote, by his stripes we are healed. He will make you quote all of a sudden Isaiah 53 where it says that. I'll get there. Hold on. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him our sins. He was beat so that you could be healed. The love of God is not for you to feel bad about what happened to Jesus. The love of God is to wake you up to the fact that Jesus would do it over and over and over to make sure that you would be saved, make sure that you would be healed. Hopefully you didn't check out on the love of God. But guess what? The love of God is so great that even if you didn't hear nothing I said all sermon, the altars are still open. The love of God is still fresh and new, and it's still roaring through here, like a roaring river in here. The love of God is not some little trickle. It's not just for a few. It's not segregated between just his people. It's not just for the Jews. It's not just for the Gentiles. It's not just for you who are sanctified and holified. not just for you who have the Holy Ghost. The love of God is shed abroad that way. But the love of God is for everybody. Right, right, right. I don't know about you, but I love him. But more than that, he loved me first. That's why I can't hate on my brother. That's why I need to get over petty little differences. Why I ought not let little things bother me. Because they're stopping the love of God in my own life. Yeah, people are horrible and they deserve a lot of things they're not going to get because the love of God says that he wants to save them. The love of God said he wants to lift them up. As they start the music right now, turn the lights off. If you're looking to feel the love of God, it's already here. You're feeling it right now. But I'm telling you right now, if you're looking to have the love of God be action in your life, if you're looking for rivers of, of living water to throw out of you, if you're looking for a healing, if you're looking for something to happen in your life, I'm telling you right now that the love of God is here for you right now. The ministry team will be down front. We'll pray for you. We'll say that's the word of the Lord. But right now, the love of God is here for you. Don't walk out of here and leave it behind. You are here. I worship you, Jesus. You don't understand where he brought me from. And even if you know where he brought me from, I don't deserve the love of God. But he still poured it out like buckets on each and every one of us.